The Tom Woods Show, episode 2132. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, if you've decided it's best not to have your kids educated by people who have declared war on you, then consider the self-taught Ron Paul curriculum. Instructors like me will give your kids an unfair advantage and an education you and I could only have dreamed of. But make sure you join through my link because only there do you get my $160 worth of free bonuses. My link is ronpaulhomeschool.com. Hello, everybody. Tom Woods here, and I am delighted to welcome to the program today John Mueller from the Department of Political Science at The Ohio State University. He's also a senior fellow of the Cato Institute, and he has a book that I find intriguing and extremely eye-opening called The Stupidity of War, American Foreign Policy and the Case for Complacency. Professor Mueller, welcome to the show. Thanks. Great to be here. This is such a tremendous book. I was just telling you on page 16, this line jumped out at me because it just runs so contrary to the way most of us have been raised to think. It's not page 16 in the overall number of pages. It's page 16 in the book. Okay, so it runs like this. In a condition of international peace, a certain degree of complacency is often justified, and it is frequently superior to the routine opposite, agitated confrontation characterized by determined and often militarized alarmism. Wow, that is about as countercultural when it comes to the current American approach to foreign policy as it is possible to be. And I think that one sentence more or less tries to justify your um, subtitle of your book. And that's the idea. That's true. Now, of course, a lot of times if you're dealing with somebody who's a true believer on the other side, if we were talking to the ghost of John McCain, he's not going to buy your thesis. But that's true of any topic. There are fence sitters, though, and we want to go after these fence sitters. But a fence sitter may say, I've heard so much about the dangers of quote unquote appeasement. And you know, we've got to go after bad actors right away before worse things happen. Is there a pithy kind of response to that that doesn't involve a dozen historical examples? Yeah, how about two? Okay. <laughs> well, one is the place where it actually started, which was the Munich Agreement of 1938. It is assumed that because Hitler was appeased at that, then he wanted to go to war. But every historian that's looked into it says he was totally unappeasable. You could give him anything. And he still would have gone to war. So the basic premise is wrong. In many cases, it does work. I'll give you the second case, which is the Cuban Missile Crisis. John Kennedy huffed and puffed and said he was going to invade Cuba unless the missiles left. And Nikita Khrushchev said, OK, how about appeasement? I'll take the missiles out. John Kennedy said, cool. And no war took place. And very often, that kind of a process will work a lot better. And it's certainly better than starting a war, which frequently is seemingly the alternative need. During the Cold War, another example, which I discuss at length in the book, it's extremely clear that the Soviet Union never in a million jillion years wanted to get into anything that was remotely resembling World War II again in Europe, quite apart from the existence of nuclear weapons. So consequently, all those policies designed to deter them from doing so were unnecessary. They simply wouldn't have done it under any circumstances. They certainly had additional interests such as fomenting revolution and class warfare and so forth. But a direct aggressive war against Western Europe was simply not in the cards. And tons of evidence suggests that they never in a million years wanted to do anything to repeat the disastrous experience, even if they were victorious, that they experienced in World War II. I think the use of Munich as a kind of trope that justifies intervention has definitely intensified since the Cuban Missile Crisis. At the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, I don't think anybody was thinking, well, if we appease Khrushchev here, then before you know it, he'll take over all of Europe. I don't think they were thinking that way. But I do think that that was used to justify the war in Iraq. I mean, we heard about why we can't appease Saddam Hussein. Do you think there's a possibility that had the neocons been in charge during the Cuban Missile Crisis, that things could have gone much, much worse? I doubt it, but maybe there were certainly hotheads, even in the Kennedy entourage, such as LeMay, General LeMay. But mostly, I think it probably would have come out the same way. There was not a real desire for war. There was a real desire to get those missiles out. And it's very clear that from the get-go, Khrushchev realized he'd overextended and was interested in just getting the best deal. And if that included someone embarrassing deal of taking the missiles out, 
he's perfectly willing to do it. So I don't think it would have escalated. The escalation was in the cards in that case. Okay, I was just wondering what you thought about that. I like in here the paraphrase of Calvin Coolidge about if you see 10 problems coming down the road, nine of them are going to turn into a ditch before they even reach you, right. which I think is true of so many things that have, not even just war, but so many things Americans have been led to panic about and then turn out to be nothing. Doesn't mean they're all going to turn out to be nothing, but if you overreact to them, there are many, many unintended consequences you're going to wind up dealing with. And so indeed, war has been one of these and the concern about, for example, Soviet expansion during the Cold War. So I want to actually jump ahead, given that I don't have a three-hour Joe Rogan-style program to cover all your topics. I want to actually jump right into the Vietnam War, because when I was a young-ish kid, let's say I was in high school in the late 80s, I was kind of turning into a little bit of a contrarian. And so my view was, well, if everybody says the Vietnam War was bad, maybe it was good. <laughs> so so I read Richard Nixon's book, No More Vietnams, and I, that was all I needed to hear. Well, he's convinced me. And since then, let's just say, my views have become rather more nuanced than that. Mm-hmm. But I had Pat Buchanan on the show once, and now he helped to make policy with Nixon. He helped write his speeches about this. So he's as invested in the narrative about the Vietnam War as it is possible to be. And I came as close as any human being on this earth has ever come to convincing him that it would have been better not to be involved. And I said, look, even from your point of view, it divided the country. It led to a cultural revolution in the country that I'm sure you don't favor. It was enormously expensive. And then even after it was over, what was the big thing? We were, okay, so Vietnam, you know, is in communist hands. Well, so what? From the U.S. point of view, what difference does that make? Life went on. Actually, the regime in Vietnam now is one of our bosom buddies as we come from China overall. Yeah, you should should also point out that a few million people died in that war. Right. If the United States hadn't gone in 1965, maybe the communists would have won then. But as you just pointed out, of course, eventually they did. The result would have been several million people who would not, mainly Vietnamese, of course, who would not be dead. And the same with the Iraq War. There's all kinds of things that could have been done in terms of negotiation, in terms of pressure on Saddam Hussein. And the idea that he was going to somehow dominate the Middle East if he ever got weapons of mass destruction, I think is basically ludicrous. In order to stop that fantasy, the United States engaged in this massive war, which has caused hundreds of thousands of lives in Iraq since that time. And in the process made the country into something that's even worse in many respects, than even under the contemptible regime of Saddam Hussein. So once again, and the same probably with Afghanistan, they went in to take the Taliban out. The Taliban is now back in, and tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of people have died in that war as well. That would not have happened if we'd basically adopted a policy of complacency. You know, if you look on paper, it could have seemed in the 1970s as if the Soviets were really on the move. I mean, you had Cambodia, you had South Vietnam, you had Laos, Angola, Mozambique, Ethiopia, South Yemen, Afghanistan, on and on, right? You see all these. But right. I'm looking at page 59. You make this point. This, this point explodes the whole thing. You say, however, almost all the new acquisitions soon became economic and political basket cases fraught with dissension, financial mismanagement, and civil warfare, and turned expectantly to the Soviet Union for maternal warmth and sustenance. So what does this therefore say about the wisdom of the containment strategy? That it was a bad idea. (laughs) That what you have there is basically a case of where the United States did adopt complacency, or at any rate, non-intervention. After Vietnam, which collapsed, of course, in 1975, the United States adopted the Vietnam Syndrome and simply watched from the sidelines as about 10 countries toppled into the Soviet camp. The result of that was to exacerbate the Soviet problems and helped bring about the end of the Soviet Union. In other words, the whole idea of containing them is foolish. Basically, if they're really so incompetent and terrible rulers, the best thing is actually let them expand. And that's what happened after 1975, as 10 countries, starting with Cambodia and Vietnam, toppled into the camp and soon found themselves relying, as the book points out, for maternal warmth and sustenance from the beleaguered Soviet Union, exacerbating its own internal problems that were there as well. I like the Kennan quote from Gibbon, there is nothing more contrary to nature than the attempt to hold in obedience distant provinces, which is exactly the problem they faced. Yeah, that's from the author of of Containment. I basically take that very seriously, as did he, by the way. But nonetheless, the containment policy was in part 
going against that dictum. Containment policy, of course, was broadly bipartisan with just a very small fringe that might complain from time to time. But really, it was very broadly bipartisan. I mean, it's true that the Democrats turned against the Vietnam War, but even that was, I think, something of an anomaly. So Mm -hmm. what do you think, as a scholar of this, does it strike you that what you conclude is a fundamentally misguided policy went almost unquestioned for half a century? Yeah, I, I, I certainly questioned it. And after the fact, you could look back on it. But because people agree with something doesn't mean it's a good idea. The idea, for example, after 9-11, that al-Qaeda was going to commit further attacks on the United States of even greater magnitude proved obviously to be completely wrong. But nonetheless, there's bipartisan support for massive efforts to deal with it. Actually, after Vietnam, there was something, the Vietnam syndrome actually lasted for quite a while. And the United States was actually following a policy that was fairly mellow. It did turn back Saddam Hussein in the Gulf War in 1991. But uh, in Bosnia, basically stood, you know, they did not really send boots on the ground until after the war was effectively over. And Kosovo, it basically never got closer than 40,000 feet to drop bombs. And it stayed out of other areas. It certainly stayed out of Somalia after it got kicked around a bit there. And I think in many respects, there would have been a policy, something resembling a complacency, had it not been for 9 11. And then we had probably the most massive overreaction in all history in American history, perhaps, leading to those two disastrous wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq. But without that, without 9-11, I don't think those wars would have taken place. Let me go back to your chapter on uh, the quest to identify threats, because with the Soviet Union no more, then there were some people who thought, okay, the Soviet Union is gone. We don't, we don't need NATO now. We, can, we don't need this permanent military establishment. We can maybe go back to being a normal country again. That was not to be. And there were others who seemed to, either through intellectual inertia or whatever, we have this huge establishment, might as well use it for something, did indeed begin to look around for other threats. Now, is that because from their international relations courses, they were just trained to think of the United States in that way, or they really held out the promise of what a unipolar world could be? Or was it merely cynical material gain being sought by some people because I happen to work for Raytheon or something? I mean, what were the motivations here? Well, I and mean, most of them were pretty sincere, unfortunately. I'd like to think they were all just manipulated or self-interested. And in some cases, as you point out, they were. But there's just this quest to identify new threats. And the current one is China, which I have a chapter on that whole episode, the whole issue. China is definitely growing economically, though it's in a fair amount of trouble right now. And if it does grow, it'll be more important economically. That's not necessarily a bad thing. That means they can buy more of our debt, for one thing. But there's an effort to try to see them as being aggressive in the sense of wanting to take over other countries. And with the exception, obviously, of the Taiwan issue, they do not seem to have any Hitlerian territorial ambitions. They do want to play a bigger role in the world stage. Their size and importance perhaps justifies that. They could be very helpful potentially with trying to get Afghanistan back into some sort of sense of normalcy and off the agenda. But the United States keeps seeing anything moves they do, particularly in the last 10 years, as being aggressively hostile. And I simply don't see it. It seems to me appeasement would work fairly well with them because the main thing they want is more international recognition, which is basically pure vapor as far as I'm concerned. And if they want to wallow in ideas that they are a superpower and uh, stoking their ego, it really doesn't cost anything. But they don't have ambitions to take over, you know, Japan or or South Korea or anything else, except obviously the Taiwan issue and to try to Also, straighten out the situation in the South China Sea, which is extremely vital to them from the standpoint of trade. And so consequently, they're interested in keeping that situation in which the U.S. Navy can't close it off on the whim of a president, such as Donald Trump, is understandable. And we should be working with them to uh, assuage their fears about that in that area. There are certain features of the Chinese regime that have leaked out that are of varying degrees of reliability, but that, you know, that of course cast the regime in a fairly negative and authoritarian light. And so 
I think some of the motivation here is that China seems like a frightening regime. And then I hear on from both many Democrats and Republicans, they are convinced that China has global imperial ambition. So you have this regime where you're hearing about slave labor and organ harvesting and a social credit system. And then the, the same people telling us about this are telling us that they do indeed, they imagine themselves as overtaking the United States. Is this all just nothing? Well, it's just, it should be put in, in context. The way the regime is going is very bad from my standpoint, both from a civil liberty standpoint and also from an economic standpoint. I think what Xi's doing, is, is, is Xi Jinping's doing is, and he says this repeatedly, the most important thing is to keep the Communist Party in power. Uh, only secondarily is economic growth important. And he's doing case after case of basically effectively cutting back on Chinese growth overall. In terms of the international thing, what they say mostly is not so much that China wants to take over stuff, but that it wants to increase its influence. And that's one of those vapid things, like you mentioned from an international relations class, about what the hell is influence anyway. They've been trying to spread their influence in recent years with this Belt and Road Initiative, sort of trying to swing their economic weight and giving out loans. And mostly that's blown up in their face when they try to enforce getting the money back because they've foolishly loaned it to unreliable regimes. The reaction is pretty much negative. So I think basically they, if they get influence, it's probably not going to make much difference one way or the other. Secondly, the influence doesn't mean much of anything. And thirdly, insofar as they're doing it, it's mostly not working out very well from their standpoint. Now, the same with uh, what they sometimes talk about is wolf warrior diplomacy. They didn't like what Australia was doing, and they demanded that it close down a think tank. Australia refused to do that, and so they cut off buying coal from Australia. So now Australia has to sell its coal to India. That kind of thing doesn't exactly warm the hearts of the people who are so threatened. So in very important countries, India, South Korea, Japan, and Australia, public opinion then is clearly swinging in a decidedly anti-Chinese direction. So with their wolf warrior diplomacy or with their economic might, they're trying to gain influence, if anything, going in the opposite direction. All right, before I go on, let me remind you about an app that's going to make your life way better, that's going to make you well-informed in a short period of time. Sounds kind of like the Tom Woods show a little bit, doesn't it? But I'm talking about Blinkist, which takes all kinds of nonfiction categories of books and slims those books down for you to just 15 minutes of listening or reading. So you get all the key points, no fluff. I've told you about the old, old classics they have, like Machiavelli's The Prince and Seneca on Stoicism, but of course, also a ton of modern books. For example, The Self-Driven Child, The Science and Sense of Giving Your Kids More Control Over Their Lives. That is perfect for our audience. And then you'll even find on Blinkist Murray Rothbard's book, For a New Liberty. And that's one of the early libertarian books I read that helped put things together for me, that helped me realize that in one area after another, there was a freedom-based answer to what ails us. It's the kind of thing that changes your life when you read it. And that's the kind of title you'll find many of at Blinkist. Well, right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Woods to start your free seven-day trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Woods to get 25% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Woods. Let's hold Russia till the very end and move to Iran because you have a chapter on these three powers. Now, of course, several years after the second war in Iraq, there were rumblings of war in Iran and it looked almost as if it was a slam dunk that it was going to happen. And then, I don't even remember the details anymore, it was 2007, I think, some intelligence report came out that basically exploded the claims about the Iranian nuclear program and it really took the wind out of their sails. But it keeps flaring up from time to time, and Trump was very hostile toward Iran. It's incredible that Iran has evaded American attack for so long, given the rhetoric has been just unrelenting. It would have been nice to see, from my peacenik point of view, Trump on Nixon to China grounds actually going and negotiating with the Iranians, because only he could have gotten away with it. But of course, 
nobody was creative enough to think to do that. What do you think the prospects are for U.S.-Iranian relations? Well, they don't look pretty good. They didn't look all that good because of the Americans in many respects. But there's also now uh, what has happened is because of the various pressures on Iran is they've got a very hardline regime, even more so than they had before. But basically, Iran is a disaster area from its own. You know, the, the mullahs have been voted out of office, even in sort of by a very biased elections, about six or eight times. They only allow a certain number of people to run for the presidency. And the Iranian people have almost always picked the one that is most moderate. There's huge protests against, repeatedly against much of their economic policies, as well as the religious police that are constantly in the way. Uh, it seems to me, basically, as far as Iran is concerned, it's starting a war, which is extremely unlikely after the result of the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war. Mm. Starting a war doesn't make any difference. And what the United States is basically be about the policy of complacency. In the long run, I think the regime is pretty much doomed because of the internal discontent. But by stoking the pressure, if anything, it helps internal support for the regime. It just seems to me they don't present much of a threat. There's concerns about Israel and so forth, and they're trying to win influence, that magic word, in places like in various parts of the Middle East. But for the most part, I think it's a very feeble, weak regime, extremely unpopular, And what one can do is stand aside and let the unpopularity gradually grind it down. That was happening for a while, though that seems to be a bit reversed now, partly because of the intense hostility coming from the West. And of course, there was actually a pretty good agreement put together in the Obama administration. Yeah. And Trump abrogated that, which is one of the main reasons the hardliners are doing so well. It seemed to be really a progressive development, keeping them probably from getting nuclear weapons. And certainly putting it off for a long time. And mostly, uh, I don't, you know, it just seems to me that process should have been continued. And then one of the problems with Biden, it seems to me a lot of people have been saying this, is he hasn't, even though he's, you know, said what I just said more or less, more or less at various times in the campaign, he really hasn't reworked that agreement and gotten rid of what Trump did to it. Maybe it'll happen in time, who knows. But it's looking only middling good now. I wonder if he was reading polls on that, because I don't know what the polls said about Obama's agreement, but Iran has been so demonized that I wonder, is there a big constituency out there for let's get that agreement going again? I don't know. People are not paying all that much attention to Iran no. now. Yeah, there's, there are plenty of other things they have to worry about. You can probably get away with it. Yeah. One of the main issues in the book is also the obsession with nuclear weapons. It seems to me that if Iran gets nuclear weapons, They'll use them the same way everybody else has, namely to deter real or imagined threats and to stoke their ego. If North Korea gets the weapons, a similar sort of thing. They think they have to do it because there's the threat from the United States and that, you know, it works well with the ego thing. Since 1945, the number of people killed by nuclear weapons explosions has been zero. The number of people who have been killed because of armed efforts to stop proliferation has been in the hundreds of thousands. That was the main reason for the war in Iraq in particular, and also sanctions even before that. So it just seems to me that we should cool it. In the case of uh, North Korea, Biden just doing something the other day, we got to get agreement on nuclear weapons to get rid of nuclear weapons. Well, the North Koreans, that's an existential issue. They think their existence depends on keeping those nuclear weapons. Therefore, there's basically nothing you can do about it. They won't give on that. And to put that on the front burner, before he can do anything else, I think is very foolish. On the other hand, at various times, they have sort of suggested on Kim Jong-un, who's there now, that they really want to join the world economically. They really like what's happening in China and particularly, obviously, Singapore. So the possibility of them gradually mellowing, if you put nuclear weapons at the back burner, not the front burner, is real. It was looking pretty good a couple of years ago in that respect, and the South Korean regime was interested in doing that. But the United States was standing in the way, and things have gotten worse since that time. I'm just curious because I personally have considered it. Have you ever visited Iran? No, I never have. Okay. I've actually thought about it because why not? I think it'd be an interesting place to see. Let's go to the third of the trifecta, though, which is the trickiest one right now, and that's Russia. I remember in one of the debates that Mitt Romney had with Barack Obama, 
Romney made some statement about Russia someday becoming our greatest threat or biggest enemy, something like that. And people dismissed him. And now he's saying, ah, you should have listened to me. I tried to warn you. What's your assessment of Russia? Everybody has an opinion on Russia, but I find almost everybody's opinion is exactly the same as everybody else's on it. Yeah, well, I've, I've looked at that pretty carefully. And there's a lot of it in the book, which I think might have avoided if the policy carried out there had been carried out, this war might have been avoided overall. Essentially, what's happened, going back to the 1990s, before Putin, long before Putin, is that as NATO expanded, the uh, Russians increasingly said that we find out a threat to our security. Now, it was not designed to be a threat to Soviet security or Russian security, but that concern was being heard in all quarters, not simply a nationalist to hyper-nationalists, not simply former communists or current communists, but from the liberal Western-oriented elite in many respects. And I think we did not do enough to take it seriously. In other words, the fact that you're not threatening in your own mind, you're not threatening Russian security is not the relevant thing. The relevant thing is, do they think you are threatening their security? And repeatedly, even before Putin, they were saying, we find this very unsettling. Why don't you stop it? And so it seems to me they should have. They should have basically appeased Putin and appeased his predecessors on that issue because it was a legitimate concern. It's perfectly reasonable to say they've exaggerated the threat. We're not a threat. And I think that's correct. The United States has no intention of invading or NATO uh, of invading. But what should have been done from the get-go is say, okay, we hear you. What can we do to assuage this problem? One possibility was very easy, which was they're very concerned up to more recent times. They're very concerned NATO might have Ukraine join NATO. Well, as a matter of fact, Ukraine has been such a basket case, particularly because of corruption overall, that its chances of getting into NATO under the best of circumstances were remote. And so a possibility would have been able to say as well, effectively, even under the best of circumstances, Ukraine will never get into NATO for like 25 years. It'll take them that long to reform, to get into up to snuff. And even then, maybe they may, they may not get in. But strong opposition, particularly from the French and the, and the Germans. So all you had to do is say, okay, we won't let them in at least for 25 years, at which point Putin would be 95 years old. And another possibility would have been to say, okay, let's work out a neutrality thing like we worked out for Austria after World War II in the mid-1950s. Both of those possibilities were there. They are on the table, but they were not really brought up. I think it, it is still not quite clear because we don't, can't get inside of Putin and so forth. And he may be ill and so forth, and he's surrounded by sycophants and stuff. So I can't be sure about this. But it seems likely that if you look at their explicit demands, they could have been met trivially. We're not going to let Ukraine in for 25 years any, anyway. So why don't we say, okay, we won't let them in for 25 years. We'll have a moratorium. And then we'll look at it again. Or why can't we work out a deal in which they stay out of NATO, but get some sort of guarantees a la Austria? Neither of those were really pursued. And I suspect strongly that they could have. There are some additional concerns about getting rid of Nazis in Ukraine and also uh, reducing the defense budget in Ukraine. Those possibly could have been worked out as well. The Nazis don't basically don't exist. So I think that was sort of a a canard that basically exacerbated the Russians, but I think probably could have been dealt with. So it seems to me that, again, with a caveat that I can't be certain about this because I can't get inside of Putin's mind. And I was very surprised, actually, that he actually invaded. I thought that was incredibly foolish and couldn't imagine he would be that stupid. But I think that if you look at the demands they're making as of last December, that was a few months before the war, those were ones that you could work with. They're also worried about having too much NATO stuff close to their border. Well, what's the problem there? We'll move it back. Just as, for example, Khrushchev took the missiles out of Cuba, it didn't make a whole lot of difference in the strategic environment, and that wouldn't either. So there was a possibility of complacency. It doesn't present a threat, and it does have real concerns it, that we don't really believe the concerns are justified, but they'd believe it. You know, if you insult somebody, they're insulted. Even if you didn't intend to insult them, the issue is not whether you, your intent was, 
but whether they feel insulted. And to a degree that was happening. In general, by the way, what was happening was, and I got this from a number of people working in the State Department, that the general attitude toward Russia is it didn't matter. They're being treated, they're being dissed continuously. And for example, in, after Biden came into office, the Russians point out, and these are not Putin types, point out that they sent two messages to the United States saying, we want to talk about our security concerns over Ukraine. And the United States didn't respond, period. There's no response. That's even worse than rejecting the response, the foray. And it was that attitude, I think, that, that sort of gathered steam within the Putin administration and ultimately led to this incredibly tragic war. I don't mean to put you in a difficult spot, but I'm curious to know, as somebody just concerned about the well-being of mankind, what the possible scenarios are here for this conflict in Ukraine to end. I mean, if the demand is, well, Putin just has to leave and get nothing, that may satisfy you morally, it would satisfy everybody morally. But the question is, is it likely? So then if they're just going to send resources and weapons to Ukraine, then this just bogs down forever and nobody's seeking a diplomatic solution. What are the possible outcomes? What's the likely outcome? Yeah, well, it's, uh, I'd, I'd like to have an answer to that. You put it extremely well. The thing that really caused the problem was they're taking over a southern and eastern Ukraine and apparently trying to you know, run us areas, either as fiefdoms or even incorporating them into the, in Russia, potentially. And so that may be very difficult to negotiate our way out. Before that, even after the war began, and the Ukrainian government was beginning to move in this direction, it would have been possible potentially to go back and get the Ukraine agreement worked out and have the threat end, as long as they weren't taking new Ukrainian territory. Of course, the uh, Russian army has performed so badly that the Ukrainians now think maybe they can win the war. And with enough equipment, maybe they can. But I think the problem is going to be, as you suggest, just sort of an endless stalemate, potentially even a frozen conflict, but maybe like the one that was happening between Ukraine and the breakoff regions since 2014. So it could go on a long time. I'm pretty pessimistic, I'm afraid. Well, I wonder if maybe the wild card here is the Russian public. I don't know how we can assess Russian public opinion. Maybe at the beginning, who knows? Maybe a majority of them favored it. But as they perceive the increasing and I think hard to anticipate the level of international isolation they're now enduring, I wonder if they just get tired of it. And at some point, the regime cannot persist in this indefinitely if the country is really, really dead set against it. Am I being naive? No, not at all. But it's the question is whether that's going to be consequential. The wars in Korea and Vietnam, I'm actually just doing some writing about this, also had a decline of public support, but they dragged on forever nonetheless. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a so, great point. Yeah, I had yeah. a guy sort of on the, on the left, but a left dissident named Lee Camp on the show not long ago. And he said that the thing that opened his eyes about the way societies work, even the so-called free societies of the West, was that there were massive, massive, massive protests against the war in Iraq, and they didn't amount to anything. Absolutely nothing changed because of that. And these are in what we consider to be the free societies. So one would presume that the regime in Russia would be still more isolated from public opinion, but I guess we'll just have to see. So Yeah, well, there is a comparison. They've done the study of uh, support for the war in Korea, in which there was no anti-war movement, and the war in Vietnam, in which there was. And the decline of support for the war is the same in both wars. It dropped off fairly quickly at the beginning, then slackened off as you get down to the harder core supporters and continue to sort of slowly erode. And the fact that there's an anti-war movement was not particularly relevant one or the other because there was not, none in Korea, and but there was one in, in, in Vietnam. Right, right. Well, what would you say, I mean, it's just in wrapping up, let's say some bright, young, aspiring foreign policy expert approached you and said, as the 21st century proceeds, what's the best piece of advice you can give me so I don't blow up the world? Well, don't blow it up. In general, things are looking really good in terms of international war. And my book deals with this quite extensively. There's been an aversion to international war that it grew over the course of the 20th century. 
And since 1945, there have been no wars until we had this one in Ukraine, in Europe, which used to be the most warlike of continents. And other countries also, who are not in Europe, have committed some international war early in this period, but not very much lately. So it seems to me the reaction in Ukraine is probably pretty interesting. One is, we don't do this anymore. It's not that they say, okay, hey, starting this war, now maybe I can start one, but quite the reverse. So I think the things in terms of international war, despite what's happening in Ukraine, are generally pretty good. The fact that the war is going so badly for the invader may also prove to be pretty deflating. We'll have to sleep. Right. Well, of course, I think that reading your book would be a very, very important thing for for somebody looking to get into this field because the orthodoxies that you will encounter in foreign policy circles in the U.S. are unfortunately quite more rigid than experience should allow them to be. And your book is, I think, a very, very important corrective to some of those orthodoxies. And of course, that book is The Stupidity of War, American Foreign Policy and the Case for Complacency by our guest, John Mueller. Professor Mueller, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks. Really great to be here. All right, everybody. Tomorrow, we've got Mark Weinstein, who is the founder of MeWe, which is one of these social media alternatives. It's kind of an alternative to Facebook. And I want to talk to him about how you do such a thing and how you cope with the network effect and how you get people over there and what his free speech policies are and all that, because we are going to need alternatives. And I've been using me, we, myself for years now for my private group. I took that thing off Facebook years ago. So if you do decide someday to join me in the Tom Woods Show Elite, which is where you, dear listener, belong as a regular listener, check out supportinglisteners.com and you'll see one of the benefits is becoming a member of our private group. And the private group takes place over on MeWe, which is really easy to learn, take you two seconds. You can join it for free. But we're going to talk to the founder of it, which I think will be an interesting conversation. So I hope to see you then. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free. And we'll see you next time. Like the sound of the Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.